Today I will be demonstrating two methods for the methylation of 2-naphthol to form 2-methoxynaphthalene, one using dimethyl sulfate and another with methyl iodide. 2-methoxynaphthalene, also known as beta-naphthal methyl ether and methyl 2-naphthal ether, as well as nirolin, however both the ethyl and methyl 2-naphthal ethers seem to be referred to as nirolin. But regardless, it is a pleasant smelling ether that finds use in perfumes. However, I'm going to be using it as a building block in future organic syntheses. To begin, I'll be showing the preparation with dimethyl sulfate on the 2-naphthal that I prepared in the previous video. I am going to be following the procedure as laid out in Vogel's Practical Organic Chemistry. 36 grams of 2-naphthal was measured out and added to a 3-necked 1-liter round-bottom flask with a thermocouple probe and addition funnel. Then a solution was prepared with 10.5 grams of sodium hydroxide in 150 milliliters of water. The base solution was used to rinse out any of the residual 2-naphthal from the weighing beaker and then was poured into the flask through the funnel in such a way as to rinse down as much of the 2-naphthal as possible. The 2-naphthal dissolves in the base solution as the phenolic hydroxyl group is deprotonated by the sodium hydroxide, forming sodium naphthalate, which is soluble in water. The darkening of the solution is due to the oxidation of the 2-naphthal in air, forming colored byproducts. Next, 31.5 grams of the extremely toxic dimethyl sulfate is weighed out and added to the addition funnel. And if you choose to work with dimethyl sulfate, you need to be very aware of the risks that it carries, especially the non-obvious ones, such as its ability to build up to lethal concentrations in air at room temperature, which necessitates the use of a fume hood. Also, one of the immediate response procedures for the skin contact with dimethyl sulfate is to soak a wad of cotton with concentrated ammonia solution and rub that into your skin where the dimethyl sulfate contacted and that's to try and hydrolyze as much of the dimethyl sulfate as possible before it absorbs through your skin and starts methylating your DNA and causing a whole host of other ailments. The solution was cooled to 10 degrees Celsius in an ice bath, and then the dimethyl sulfate was added with strong stirring over the course of one hour. As the reaction progresses, the 2-methoxynaphthalene that's formed precipitates out of solution due to its insolubility in water. After the addition of the dimethyl sulfate had been completed, the mixture is warmed on a hot water bath at 70 to 80 degrees Celsius for one hour. This heating is to drive the reaction to completion, but also to hydrolyze any remaining dimethyl sulfate so the reaction mixture is safe to handle. The melting point of 2-methoxynaphthalene is 72 degrees Celsius, so at these temperatures it liquefies and forms an oil. So here I'm checking the pH of the mixture because I want it to be basic after the heating period. However, when I check it, the pH is neutral, which means that there still could be dimethyl sulfate present in this mixture. So to remedy this, I added 5 grams of sodium hydroxide and continued heating for another 45 minutes to ensure that all of the dimethyl sulfate is destroyed. Now you can see that after the extra sodium hydroxide and additional 45 minutes of heating, the mixture is now strongly alkaline, indicating that all of the dimethyl sulfate should be hydrolyzed and the solution will be safe to handle. Here you can see the lower aqueous layer and upper molten 2-methoxynaphthalene layer, as well as the film of crystalline 2-methoxynaphthalene deposited on the walls of the flask. The mixture was then allowed to cool to room temperature, which caused the 2-methoxynaphthalene layer to solidify in the flask. The solid 2-methoxynaphthalene was then broken up, filtered, washed with a copious amount of water, and then allowed to dry in air. The crude yield was 37 grams, which is 93.6%, but we still need to do a recrystallization to improve the purity of our product. I ran the recrystallization using a minimal amount of boiling ethanol, and I tried to use activated charcoal to decolorize the 2-methoxynaphthalene. However, it didn't seem to have much effect on the overall coloration of the solution. Once everything had dissolved, I took the solution off the heat, allowing it to cool slowly to room temperature. I then placed it in the freezer for a few hours to fully crystallize, broke up the mass, and filtered it and then washed with a little ice-cold ethanol. The yield of the now dry 2-methoxynaphthalene was 31.1 grams, corresponding to a 79% yield, which is quite good comparing to Vogel's 84% yield.
The theoretical melting point of 2-methoxynaphthalene, according to the procedure in Vogel, is 72 degrees Celsius. The melting point of the 2-methoxynaphthalene that I just made was 71.3 degrees Celsius at a rate of 0.3 degrees Celsius per minute, which is a good result and allows us to say that we have successfully made 2-methoxynaphthalene. While I like the dimethyl sulfate alkylation for its speed, simplicity, and high yield, dimethyl sulfate is quite an expensive reagent and is also extremely toxic. So now I'm going to show how to make 2-methoxynaphthalene with methyl iodide, which is much less toxic, albeit still fairly toxic, and is quite a bit more accessible than dimethyl sulfate. To begin, 2.2 grams of potassium hydroxide was weighed out and added to a flask. Then 40 milliliters of methanol was added, and the mixture was stirred until completely dissolved. Next, 5 grams of 2-naphthol was added and allowed to completely dissolve. Then the solution was allowed to cool back down to room temperature. Then, 10 grams of methyl iodide is added into the flask. Then the flask is stoppered and allowed to stir at room temperature for 72 hours. After the 72 hours had elapsed, a precipitate of 2-methoxynaphthalene is seen in the flask. 250 milliliters of a 5% solution of sodium hydroxide is prepared. Then, the contents of the flask are poured into the sodium hydroxide solution and stirred for one hour, which serves to remove any unreacted 2-naphthol. The crude product was filtered off, washed with a copious amount of distilled water, and then dried thoroughly on the pump. The yield of crude 2-methoxynaphthalene from methyl iodide was 4.2 grams, which is 77%. The crude 2-methoxynaphthalene was then recrystallized from boiling ethanol. After being allowed to cool fully at room temperature, the product was placed in the freezer to cool further, and then filtered, washed with a little ice-cold ethanol, and dried thoroughly on the pump. After being allowed to dry in air, the melting point was taken at a rate of 0.3 degrees Celsius per minute, finding the melting point to be 71.7 degrees Celsius, which is an excellent result. The final yield of 2-methoxynaphthalene by the alkylation with methyl iodide was 3.3 grams, which is a not-so-excellent 60% yield. I then wanted to try and prepare a highly pure sample of 2-methoxynaphthalene by the evaporation and deposition of the material onto the walls of a cold flask. I did this in an attempt to prepare a reference sample for the melting point value of 2-methoxynaphthalene, to which I could compare my other samples with. The crystalline material I recovered ended up having a melting point of 71.5 degrees Celsius, which is comparable both to the first sample and second sample. And since all of these melting points are within 1 degree of the literature 72 degrees Celsius melting point, I can say with confidence that I have successfully made 2-methoxynaphthalene, which also gives evidence towards the successful preparation of 2-naphthal in the previous video. Now we can recap our syntheses. The larger scale dimethyl sulfate preparation yielded 79% of 2-methoxynaphthalene, while the smaller scale methyl iodide methylation only yielded 60% of 2-methoxynaphthalene. We can see from the rightmost deposited 2-methoxynaphthalene that it is pure white. And comparing to the other two samples, which are slightly off-white, that might indicate the presence of a slight impurity in those samples. But since all the melting points are within one degree of each other and of the literature, we can be sure that our product is pure enough for moving forwards with future syntheses.